Welcome back to lecture four on antibiotics and antimicrobial therapy. Um, up to now, we've focused on promoting for beta-lactam antibiotics. In this lecture, we're going to um, change our focus and look at other antibiotics which act on other parts of the uh, um, bacterial machinery. So this is part six. Um, the first system I want to talk about briefly are a um, class of antibiotics called the, um, which directly damage the outer cell membrane of, of bacteria, particularly gram-negative bacteria. As we all, you should recall, gram-negatives are particularly difficult to kill with antibiotics. They have this extra membrane that you can see here. Yeah, let me just cut my pen together. So that's a gram-negative bacteria. You have this extra outer membrane here, which makes them particularly difficult to kill. There's a class of com compounds called the polymyxins, um, polymyxin B to polymyxin E, which um, can interact with this uh, lipid membrane and actually cause channels, cause pores that pass directly through the cell like so. So poly polymyxins are a class of antibiotics of the most uh, important is called colistin, also known as polymyxin E. Um, it's often known as the antibiotic of last resort. Um, it's fairly toxic, but it's effective. Um, it's a polycationic peptide. It has both hydrophilic and lipophilic moieties, which means it will interact directly with the lipid membrane, the lipid bilayer. The cationic regions interact with the outer membrane, um, binding directly to uh, the outer edge of a membrane leaflet whereas the lipophilic components will interact directly with the inter internal membrane structure and rather like a kind of fairy liquid, they will solubilize the membrane and form channels. So here's a, a rather poor quality image of um, colistin or polymyxin E. Now the problem is that already we have seen um, emergence of resistance. It's almost certainly due to the fact that Colistin has been used as a way of, of um, uh, in, uh, in probably in pig farming, it's believed in China. And this first paper, this paper came out just in 2016 in the Lancet. You see here, it says the emergence of plasmid mediated colistin resistance. Um, and it discusses the mechanism of this. But one issue here is it's a plasmid mediated resist resistance, which means the plasmid is also mobile and can go on and transfect. Um, and bring this mutation across to other bacteria, not just um, not just the, uh, the E. coli strain they looked at here, but this is a, a, a mobile strain. But it's also you see here been found in Klebsiella pneumoniae and Pseudomonas originosa, which is very very concerning. So it basically means this antibiotic of last resort is um, uh, becoming less effective. So the mechanism of resi of resistance is, is interesting. It's believed that it's due to um, the uh, phosphorylation of, a, I should say, the addition of a phosphodiphenylamine uh, moiety in red that you see here onto lipid A. Lipid A is a component of the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria, which we see here. And by interaction of this phosphate with uh, terminal phosphate on lipid A here, we form this new phosphor. Um, Double, phosphor double phosphorylated uh, lipid A with its rather, um, amine on here, um, which makes the membrane impermeable to colistin. Uh, um, so obviously this is a, a highly advantageous um, adaptation of bacteria, um, hence the, the gene, the MCR1 gene, um, is positively selected for um, in bacteria which are exposed to colistin. And if you want to learn more about this, uh, you should read here the article um, here. Okay. In terms of epidemiology, this is now 2016 data. What well, you can see here that um, it, there's been widespread um, isolates of this uh, MCR1, this resistant gene found both in animals, humans and the environment in China. Um, also here you see in Malaysia, um, uh, in humans in India, um, and I think that'd be Saudi Arabia, um, animals and humans in the US and most of Europe, and animals in, in, and the environment in France. So it's, it's, it's pretty much spread out of China, 
um, and this is a a a, um, a cause of grave concern. Just like we are experiencing now with COVID-19, um, once a, a um, new bacteria or new virus is a is um, has gained an evolutionary advantage, it can move into the population. It moves quickly. Okay, so the next uh, part of this lecture really is is to change tack and now consider drugs which target protein synthesis in bacteria directly. The, this is probably the either the biggest or the second biggest class of bacteria of antibiotics after the uh, beta lactams. They work in very different ways from beta lactams and can be used in combination. Um, and broadly, they are the aminoglycosides, which have the structure here. You can see why you have these glycosides. Uh, these, these sugars, which are aminated, as aminoglycosides, such as tryptomycin. Tetracyclines, again, does what it says on the tin. You have four cyclic rings from tetracyclines. And then the macrolides, we see down here. We'll look at these in some detail. So just a little bit of revision um, from kind of a GCSE biology, if you don't recall. Um, the basic uh, way that DNA codes of proteins is by a transcription. From DNA to RNA or messenger RNA, which moves to the ribosome, where it's translated into the protein. And the sequences of the DNA sequence which contains thymine, cytosine, guanine, and adenine. This is then in the mRNA, is uh, converted across, except that the phenylalanine, um, sorry, except that thymine is converted to uracil in RNA. That's the only difference. Now, the important thing to recall. Is that you have these codons, these three-letter codons, that um, code for different amino acids. So, for example, UUC codes for phenylalanine, CUG for lysine, um, CCG here for proline. Okay, and this is the, the fundamental basis of a genetic code. So, in the cell, the ribosome is the so-called protein factory. The ribosome itself is actually made mainly of RNA itself. What the ribosome does, it reads information from messenger RNA and converts that into um, a protein uh, or a polypeptide that becomes a protein structure. And this requires three, four, essentially four different stages of the, um, for this process to happen. Initiation, where the ribosome is assembled in the correct way and the messenger RNA kind of threads into it, ready to commence for synthesis. Elongation, the amino acids are brought along in the correct order and the polypeptide which becomes a protein is formed together. Termination, when um, the process stops by so-called stop codon. The stop codon is a three-letter code in the mRNA that tells the ribosome to stop adding new amino acids. There's actually also, I should say, a start codon that tells it, again, tells the ribosome to stop to start the process of protein synthesis. And finally, this assembly, which allows the ribosome to release the uh, messenger RNA and also the, uh, the, the newly uh, formed protein. So this is a, a, a rather simplistic picture, but you see so we have a, a messenger RNA here that threads through, the, through the, the groove in the ribosome. And within the ribosome itself, we have so-called uh, transfer RNA, that's these guys here, these yellow guys here, which are bound to different amino acids. You see the amino acid here, that's phenyl phenylalanine, I think. So AAG, that codon, that, that recognises the Watson-Crick pair um, uh, complementary sequence in, the, in the messenger RNA, and they join together, and there we have our growing peptide grows out like so. Okay, we go on YouTube. There's lots and lots of um, videos of this. Medical students have to learn this kind of stuff. Uh, this link, I've not checked it. It might still be um, current, but if not, there's plenty of material out there. Um, just search for mRNA and protein synthesis. So a little bit of, uh, of revision. Um, the ribosome is the most complicated enzyme in nature. It responds for catalyzing information with peptide bond between the amino acids in the correct way and reading information from messenger RNA. So it's quite an amazing structure. And there are three kinds of RNA involved in synthesis. There are messenger RNA. We already discussed this. This is read from the genome, from the genomic DNA in the, in the cell tRNA is the transfer RNA, that's the little yellow blobs we saw in the last um, slide. Um, they bring the correct amino acid to recognise 
the uh, complementary code in the messenger RNA. And finally, rRNA is called ribosomal RNA. Actually, half the mass of the ribosome is RNA itself. Um, so, it, oddly enough, it, the, this protein factory that processes RNA is also half made of RNA. And the catalytic site is made entirely of RNA, which is interesting. You absolutely do not need to learn this, but this is um, really for, perhaps for interest. But if you remember, recall about 20 naturally occurring amino acids, phenylalanine, lysine, etc., etc., and these were different. Oh, these were different codons that can, um, uh, um, but, but different RNA codons that can code for different amino acids. So CAU um, codes for histidine, as a CAC. There's also some, re some redundancy built in. I already mentioned that you can have start codon and stop codon. So AUG is a start codon, and UAA, UAG, UGA are stop codons for tell the to stop to stop reading. Um, Again, this is a this is out of interest, but um, uh, it's uh, perhaps worth having as a reference. Um, the important thing about the ribosome in bacteria is their structure different than in uh, non-bacterial cells in eukaryotes, and that's important because one of the principles in new antibiotic design is to try and exploit differences between human cells mammalian cells, if you like, and bacterial cells. Um, and what we have in the prokaryotic ribosome are two components called 50S subunit and 60S subunit, and they come together to cause forms called 70S subunit. I have no idea why or where this numbering comes from. It's a relatively small molecular weight, 2.5 million molecular weight, compared to the eukaryotic DNA, sorry, the eukaryotic ribosome, that has a 60S and 40S component, forms an 80S, uh, combined unit. So what's the difference? The difference is the prokaryotic, prokaryotic ribosome assembles and disassembles as it makes proteins, whereas the eukaryotic ribosome stays similar as a dimer during protein synthesis. And this difference can be exploited in drug design. It's a way of avoiding toxicity to the host, uh, to, to host cell ribosomes. So how do antibiotics inhibit proteins from synthesis? There's, there's, there's a number of different mechanisms that you can exploit. Um, you can uh, bind the ribosome to prevent uh, peptide bond formation, for example, by preventing mRNA decoding by binding the 30S subunit, by preventing peptide bond formation, perhaps on 50S subunit, or you can even prevent the movement of the ribosome if you like the thread through the needle completely. Um, and as I already said, for most antibiotics, um, selectively for bacteria over mammalian cells, occurs due to the difference in the ATS ribosome that doesn't split apart into subunits when we form. The honorable exception here is chloramphenicol, um, which does have toxicity towards mammalian mitochondrial um, uh, um, um, cells and the ribosome and also the tetracyclines. But this is a, um, it's still, uh, still, chloramphenicol and tetracyclines are more toxic, much more toxic, to um, bacterial cells than to eukaryotes. So this is perhaps a, a better cartoon of, uh, of of how the ribosome works. It's it's it's, it's really a, the same concept as I showed before, just in a bit more detail. Um, and more importantly, here it shows the four um, targets. So this this this, this kind of picture of uh, Targeting the ribosome for antibiotics is really worth is really worth kind of learning. This is one of these uh, one of these uh, slides that's really worth uh, kind of copying out in neat letters and uh, sticking up on your uh, on your toilet or bedroom walls. So you can look, gaze at it and it reminds you what's going on. Right. So let's look at it bit by bit. First, to remember the um, bacterial ribosome has a 30s and 50s subunit, and it literally has a tunnel between the two components. Where the RNA is threaded from three prime to five prime end. Of course, coming out of this, it's the growing peptide chain that forms our new protein. Okay. And this, of course, is this bit here. So just 50s component there and 30s bit there. And as I said, the mRNA threads through the middle. The transfer RNA is here. This is the yellow blobs we saw before. And what they do is they bring along the, the correct amino acids, so that's a new amino acid, single amino acid, and allows B 
this bond formation to take place. So, the chloramphenicols bind 50S portion and inhibit directly this uh, peptide bond formation. The streptomycins, we'll look at these examples in a moment, they change the shape of this 30S portion and cause the messenger RNA not to be read correctly as it passes through. The tetracyclines interfere with attachment of transfer RNA, that's these guys here, to the messenger RNA by the same complex, thus preventing um, the correct reading of the RNA. Then erythromycin binds the 50S portion and prevents the actual RNA translocating from pulling through. It's, it's going to uh, inhibit uh, the, the, the cotton threading through the needle, if you will. So these, chloramphenicol, erythromycin, tetracycline, cytomycin, all examples of different ribosomal acting uh, antibiotics. Um, in more general detail, this is exactly what I showed in the last slide, but perhaps this gives, gives a, another useful kind of aid memoir. Uh, we have aminoglycosides for block initiation translation, as I said, tetracyclines for attachment, streptogramins, which are not really discussed, um, if we did with uh, distinct steps of protein synthesis, we will go into that, um, macrolides for continuation of protein synthesis, chloramphenicol we discussed, and then milliconsomides, um, uh, again, prevent a protein synthesis, and the oxalodines into the initiation, and we look at this, some of these in more detail, not all of them. Okay, let's begin with the aminoglycosides. Um, we saw an example already of streptomycin, the amino sugars linked together with glycosid, gly glycosidic bonds. Um, our first uh, example was actually discovered in 1939, oddly enough, before penicillin, um, but after penicillin was discovered, um, but before penicillin became widely available, it's obtained from streptomyces bacteria. There's a number of other um, uh, aminoglycoside natural products, including canamycin, neomycin, gentamicin, nestlemycin, and tobramycin. Um, gentamicin is often used as a topical antibiotic, particularly for earache. If you've had antibiotics um, for um, earache, and you've had a topical um, ear drops containing antibiotic, it's probably gentamicin, but you've been given. Then there are also some semi-synthetic um, equivalents, um, amikacin, which is synthesized from canamycin A. But all very polar. Um, uh, they are given uh, parenterally, i.e. by injection, topically, for example, in the ear, or directly on the skin for local skin infections. Uh, they can't be given orally. So in terms of structure, as already discussed, aminoglycosides, and again, the name suggests, are amino, are amino sugars. In general, we have three rings. Um, some are four uh, rings, four sugars. Streptomycin here has three sugars, you can see here. N-methylglucosamine, streptose and streptidine, and note the amino components here. Um, chemical structure, so we already said they're highly polar, they're basic. They form um, polycationic species at um, physiolo physiological pH, i.e. pH 5.5, pH 6. Um, normally given sulfate salts to make them more water soluble, such as gentamicin sulfate. Um, they're well distributed through, the, um, through blood um, and the lymphatic system. They don't reach the central nervous system, they don't cross blood, the blood brain barrier, um, and they also don't reach. Um, more hydrophobic components of the body, such as or, or less vascularized components, such as bone, fatty or connective tissue. Uh, clinically, um, they're used, uh, as I've already said, uh, by injection normally uh, against, and particularly when there's concern about infection from ground negative bacilli, such as Pseudomonas, um, Pseudomonas originosa, Cinetobacter, and Termobacter. They're less active on gram positives, um, are all the gram negative cocci, um, uh, such as E. coli. Uh, they're not active on the anaerobic bacteria um, because immunoglycosides need oxygen dependent transport to get inside the cell. Um, as I would say, they're widely used topically um, for skin, eye, and ear infections. Um, and they can be used directly topically for some ear infection, for some skin infections. Um, a good activity against pseudomonas originosa, which is probably the second most important 
uh, clinical uh, bug, um, particularly using combination with penicillins. One issue is that uh, particularly uh, antithelin gentamicin are quite toxic, um, and when given, they have to be given under strict, strict cl um, clinical supervision to prevent, uh, for example, um, deafness uh, or other unpleasant side effects such as kidney damage. Um, mechanisms of action, the aminoglycosides interfere, as we already said, directly with photosynthesis. They bind to this 30S subunit, ribosome uh, 30S subunit, um, they inhibit initiation of the mRNA and, um, and the whole uh, reading process, basically. They cause misreading of codons, which results in protein mutations. Um, all the bacteria static at lower dose, high dose can directly back to the cidal. Um, expect, 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 expect in the myosin, which is back to static at high dose, it's not back to the um, at all. Uh, this is a rather nice, um, I think this is either compu this is probably computational or possibly, um, uh, um, yeah, I think this is actually the computation models of how uh, the aminoglycosides actually bind in the, in, in, the, in the groove. What we see here in yellow is our, is our um, uh, aminoglycoside. You can see really quite neatly here how it binds in to the uh, the active site this, 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 um, on the uh, uh, on the uh, um, on the ribosome itself. Again, if you're interested, you can read the article. Read the article in Science there. And as I mentioned, it's often used in combination um, with beta lactams with the penicillins. Um, Aminoglycosides are good for pseudomonas um, infections, um, but then can be used, for example, carbenicillin, beta lactam gentamicin, or penicillin G and streptomycin, enterococci, infection, particularly endocarditis, which is infection of the heart valves. The concept here being that penicillins help to damage the cell wall membrane, they help, therefore, help to allow the aminoglycosides easier access into the side of the cell whether to reach the ribosome. If you recall, um, the ribosome is internal within the cell in the cytoplasm. Therefore, to be effective, your aminoglycoside, your drug, has to get through the cell membrane to reach it. And by using a combination therapy with a um, membrane damaging um, antibiotic, you can uh, get, a, in effect, a synergistic effect. Uh, resistance, of course, has been seen. You'll be unsurprised to learn. Um, uh, primarily, uh, in terms of uh, two principal mechanisms, I should say. Um, one is uh, in terms of a bacteria um, adapting uh, or, or mutating such that they don't um, uh, uh, they don't bring the, the drugs in as quickly, or, or if you do get it, they pump them out faster. Um, but importantly, also is inactivating inactivating the drugs by phosphorylation. Or other chemical check or ever chemical means, um, and this inactivation is probably one of the most important um, uh, um, mechanisms, chemical, molecular me mechanisms of resistance. Um, there's an enzyme called amino acetyltransferase or AAC, and this does it acetylates the amino groups on the ring. For example, um, so AAC, well, quite acetyl group on that amine, this amine here. There's another um, enzyme called aminoglycoside phosphotransferase, or APH, and it's just a similar thing, but it phosphorylates the hydroxy groups on ring one, you see there, and ring three there. This is an example, it's canamycin A. Okay, and this slide really pretty much shows the same, uh, uh, the same thing. Now the point is that the genes for this enzyme, the APH gene, which codes for uh, um, APH, the uh, aminoglycoside phosphotransferase, is found in Staphylococcus aureus, Enterococcus facilis, and other bacteria. And of course, once you start using these drugs, you will end up creating selection pressure for bacteria which overexpress this, um, these enzymes. So you end up with resistance uh, uh, just by uh, um, natural selection. So one 
approach to trying to get around this problem is to make derivatives uh, which are um, inactive, which are um, immune to these enzymes. Um, and the, straight, the straightforward way was to remove the functional groups which um, are, are susceptible to enzymatic inactivation. For example, here's gentamicin and tevomycin. They don't have this uh, uh, um, the, the hydroxy group in ring one, the free family hydroxy group in ring one. So it makes the resistance APH. Amikarsin, um has the, uh, um, the amino and ring three um, uh, um, acylated, and therefore it's more resistant to the AAC enzyme at this side. Here's amikarsin, just to see here the different uh, ways of representing uh, planar and 3D structures. Gentamicin and tobamycin, and note the absence of, of the OH group in gentamicin and tobamycin. In terms of structure activity relationship with aminoglycosides, uh, in other words, what you can play with and what you can't. Um, ring one, this guy here, is the um, gives a broad spectrum activity. Um, but it is, as we've already seen, major site for enzymatic inactivation by both AAC and APH. You also need to have amino groups, 6.25 positions, um, and phosphorylation of um, the tertiary OH will reduce binding to ribosome subunit, which is why it works. Okay, just a little bit more on the structure activity, activity relationship of amino glycosides. Um, I just talked through this briefly. Ring two here can accept a few structural modifications. Um, for example, you can acetylate the amino group at position one, which is this guy here to make, for example, amikarsin. Uh, ring two, you have some, sorry, I've, um, ring two can, as we see here, also can be a ribose or streptose or streptamine, the different sugar um, configurations. A ring three is less sensitive to change, but you can, um, uh, you can play around with this amino group here on um, this amino group here can be primary or secondary. Okay, let's move on now to streptomycin as an example of an um, important amino glycoside. I think this is the first amino glycoside I've discovered. Um, like many of the amino glycosides, it's more active against gram negatives and gram positives. Um, it's used for a mycobacterium bacteria. So it's for, for example, uh, tuberculosis causing bacteria. Um, unfortunately, resistance was rapidly uh, seen, um, but is still used in combination with other with other antibiotics. Um, you can't give it orally; um, it's not absorbed and is destroyed by um, acid hydrolysis in the gut. Um, at lower dose, it only induces misreading for messenger RNA. Uh, here's paramycin, just another example. Here we have um, uh, um, four rings in the structure with a broad spectrum activity, but again, poor oral availability. It's used primarily for gastrointestinal tract infections called by Salmonella or Shigella um, or Protozoa. Um, so, for example, food poisoning, um, dysentery, that kind of thing. Gentamicin is a, uh, a common uh, example of. Uh, a um, amino glycoside again tends to be used topically um, in the ear for um, if you've had um, antibiotic ear drops it's likely it would be gentamicin probably gentamicin sulfate the sulfate increases its solubility um, it's good against pseudomonas aeruginosa as we see here uh, but there are serious issues with systemic toxicity my, mo uh, my mother was given this when she was in hospital and she was told that if they get injected too quickly it could make her deaf um, luckily, they did it slowly. Um, it's also particularly nephrotoxic, liver, um, kidney toxic, um, but it is effective and it's still used. Um, still, it's still used systemically um, for uh, people who are profoundly uh, um, sick. Okay, moving on now to the tetracyclines. Um, these are orally available drugs, so it's different from most amino glycosides. Bacteria static, discovered in the sixties. Um, they penetrate the cell wall, uh, but they diffuse through or also move through porins, um, and they inhibit protein synthesis by binding to the 30S ribosome subunit. Um, principal um, resistance mechanisms are 
enhanced efflux, where the bacteria overexpresses proteins to pump them out, and also the ribosome itself is modified so it can't attach properly. Um, we have a number of different uh, modifications of the basic tetracycline structure. We'll have a look at the SAR in a moment. In fact, here we are, it's the SAR of tetracyclines. Here's the core for so-called pharmacophore. The pharmacophore means a bit you can't fiddle around with. Okay, and that's measured, as shown here in this box. But you know that we have possibilities of doing quite some chemical modifications on all these groups here, where I'm pointing. Uh, two most common uh, prescribed systems are doxycycline, this is doxycycline here, and minocycline here. And um, doxycycline, we have put a methyl group on here, and an OH group on this ring. And you see in minocycline, they have um, added a uh, 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 amino um, uh, a bimethyl amino group on this ring here. You see that. Okay. Moving on now to the macrolides. Um, these are again ribosome acting, but a very different structure. You have really two components. You have this primary kind of ring structure here, which I'm circling now, and attached to it are sugars. So quite a different mode, quite a different structure than we've seen before. Um, the original microlide was discovered in 1952, it's a product, um, and it's from a product of Streptomyces aureus, which is a bacteria. Um, note, we've seen 40 membered lactone ring to which deoxy sugars are attached. So this is a, a, core, uh, a core circular bit, if you like, this 40 membered lactone ring. And then you have various deoxy sugars that's attached on the side. Um, it inhibits protein synthesis by binding this time to the 50S ribosomal subunit. Um, erythromycin has problems with acid lability, uh, it's a rather narrow spectrum, it's not tolerated well in the gastrointestinal tract and, has in a, and is rooted out rather quickly from the system. But there are derivatives of, um, of this. Uh, erythromycin is not used much now, but um, other systems are such as clarithromycin and is azithromycin. They have broad spectrum activity, metapharmacokinetics, um, and improved tolerability. A mode of action is, uh, is interesting. Um, what you notice, it um, interferes with the direct peptide bond formation um, in the 50S subunit. So if you recall, as we saw before, the ribosome assembles a transfer RNA with um, individual um, amino acids on the end here, it's an arginine, and um, then allows the two uh, amino acids to, to couple together to form a, a peptide bond. And the macrolide prevents this actually happening. The macrolides actually prevent this happening. So a different mode of action than we've seen before. Okay, there are a number of different macrolide, um, macrolides on the market. There is uh, ephriomycin, carifomycin, and uh, roxifomycin, and others. Um, and they're basically being played around with to uh, try and improve their general GI um, uh, stability, um, uptake, um, and mode of action. So roxifomycin, you can see there's this been this mefoxy uh, group tacked on the end here. But the only difference between clarifomycin and arifomycin is you can just about spot it. Is this is we have a uh, a methyl uh, ether here compared with an alcohol in erythromycin here. Um, it took, took me quite some finding to spot the difference. Okay, mechanism action already said, inhibits protein synthesis by binding 50S subunit, maybe bacteriostatic, but maybe bactericide at high concentrations. Um, and resistance, unfortunately, is already seen. 80% of methicillin resistant Staph aureus strains also are resistant to macrolides, which is uh, unfortunate. And the principal mechanism of resistance is active efflux. These are where the, um, uh, these are efflux pumps. These are um, protein channels in the outer membrane of the bacteria, which pump out um, the drug. Um, furthermore, there is a uh, um, possibility of older target site. That's what we see mainly in Europe in terms of resistance mechanisms, compared by the ERM gene. And this alters the binding site on the ribosome. Um, and we get cross resistance occurs between all macrolides, which means if you have resistance to one particular macrolide, it's likely you'll have resistance to the whole, whole um, 
whole class of drug. Right, moving on now to the oxo, one I can never pronounce, the oxazolidones, or oxazolidolatuones. Um, these were a really quite a unique class of drug discovered um, um, in 1998. Um, and they were found, interestingly, by high throughput screening. So this is the idea where you take lots and lots and lots of small molecules um, and you uh, basically use a robot and uh, computational algorithms to select the likely candidates for antimicrobial activity. You then test them and you refine, perhaps down for millions of potential leads down to one or two uh, molecules which are actually effective. So this is the first generation developed by DuPont in 98. Um, and note the basic structure, you have a six-membered benzyl ring here, and you have this five-membered uh, ring here. Um, this first, this first uh, example was dropped uh, due to toxicity. There are other derivatives, as we will see. And what it's believed to do is prevent the 50S and 30S uh, subunits of the ribosome coming together to make the initiation complex. So it inhibits this uh, coming together of uh, ribosomal components. And if the components don't come together, then the ribosome can't work and can't make proteins. So again, a very different structure from the other ribosomal active drugs we've seen to date. Linozolid is um, one of the more successful of the oxytoalazodones. Um, similar uh, activity as vancomycin, which is good, um, only active against gram positive bacteria. Um, and although there are some toxicity issues and side effects, it um, is approved in, um, in certain situations where other drugs have failed. So lidocinate, as I said, is the first antibody from the structural class. Um, this is just looking at the SAR. Um, and the basic, uh, uh, the, the basic Falca core is the benzyl ring and five-membered ring here. Um, plus we need the correct stereochemistry here with a um, 5S configuration there. Um, we also need to have the acylo amino ethyl group here. The base morpholinear group in this case um, improves the PK properties and makes it more water soluble. Um, and this fluorine here improves activity. Um, not necessarily sure if it's clear why that's the case, but that does appear to be the case. Um, this SAR, as I already mentioned, requires basically uh, these three components this uh, ring here, the benzyl ring, the uh, a five-membered uh, heterocycle here, and then this uh, this uh, final component here. But we have possibility to play around, as I've seen with, with linozolid, with what we stick on the end of the benzyl ring. We also have the possibility of substituting the proton here on the benzyl ring for fluorine. Again, we saw that with linozolid. So as I said, we have a rather unique um, uh, site of action, uh, mode of action. But if you recall, in bacteria, 30S component and 50S component have to come together from this kind of a this, this sort of sandwich. Um, the mRNA, in fact, the mRNA first binds the 30S unit here. What should happen in a successful protein synthesis? These two components come together to form a sort of simple S initiation complex. What? happens with, with uh, linozolid and all this whole class of antibiotics is they block this coming together here. So this doesn't happen. The two components can't come together. So this suggests so initiation complex is blocked and therefore um, the ribosome cannot produce, cannot synthesize proteins. Um, as ever, this has already been observed. Um, due to uh, mutations in one of the uh, ribosomal RNA genes, uh, which presumably affects the ability of uh, the oxalidin two ones to bind. Uh, but there are other analogs which appear to have better, um, uh, better, better um, activity, both against gram positive and gram negative bacteria. BMS, by the way, is Bristol Myers Squip, which I think no longer exists. I think it's going to be taken over by Novartis or GSK. 
Okay, let's move on now to um, another class of antibiotic, which again is a different mode of action than we've seen to date. These antibiotics which target enzymes involved in DNA replication. So keep in mind, every time the bacteria um, divides, it has, to um, it has to make a complete copy of its whole chromosome. And to do this, it uses a um, number of different enzymes, including the so-called topper isomerases. So the fluoroquinolones are a class of um, antibiotic which act on the two nuclear enzymes involved in the, uh, uh, the replication of, a, of the bacterial DNA. If you keep in mind that most bacteria um, divide and they rapidly, perhaps for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and so in doing so, they need to make a copy, a complete copy of their genome, which is several million base pairs um, every time. To do this, they employ a, a number of different enzymes, um, and the ones we're concerned with here, which are the targets of the fluoroquinolones, the top of isomerase 4, and that's involved in the separation of daughter DNA um, molecules. That's the, uh, the, the, the copied molecule that you can see here in green, um, and DNA gyrase, which is involved in removing um, too much supercoiling from the DNA strands. So it's a bit, uh, DNA gyrase is a bit way, like a way of just preventing your uh, your knitting getting all all, uh, all tangled up. That's one way of seeing it. Um, this may seem slightly obscure in terms of their mode of action, but it's very, very critical. And basically, if these enzymes don't work or inhibited, then the bacteria doesn't replicate properly. As you see here, DNA gyrase um, basically changes the geometrical configuration of, uh, of the chromosomal DNA to the isomerase actually takes it back the other way. It's it both involved in desupercoiling, in this case, or super, um, it's like super coil, forming supercoil with DNA gyrase or desupercoiling from top of isomerase 4. And the primary um, example, one of the best examples of drugs which do this are the quinolones, particularly the fluoroquinolones. Um, major therapeutic advance, very different mode of action we've seen before, again, exploit the fact that. Um, Bacteria, the bacterial chromosome is not contained within the nucleus, it's just free floating uh, within the cytoplasm. The fluoroquinolones, fluoroquinolones have broad spectrum activity, have good PK properties, good bite availability, tissue penetration, and good half lives, and quite safe. Um, one issue is they're expensive. In general, many drugs that contain fluorine tend to be more expensive because it's more difficult to work with. Um, and of course, resistance has already been seen. Okay, so the modes of action are this, as I said, it's inhibition of top isomerase, which is used in DNA synthesis. Um, and that's DNA gyrase, which removes the supercoiling, which I think that's what I said before. If it's not what I said before, this is correct. Um, and top isomerase um, is, um, is used for separation of the, uh, the daughter DNA products following replication. The fluoroquinones are bactericidal in action.